you will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in a listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. In the first part of section one, you will hear a weather forecast in London and the southeast coast of England. As you listen, fill in the table. Now you will have some time to look at questions one to four. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to four. And now here is Colin with details of the weather. Thank you, Francis. Here is the weather forecast for the next 24 hours for London and the southeast coast of England. In the morning, it will be mainly dry with a light mist, with temperatures around 8 to 10 degrees Celsius. Later in the afternoon, there will be a few scattered showers. By midnight, it will become cloudy in most areas. And there will be heavy rain with winds becoming strong and reaching gale force along the coast. The temperature will drop to four to five degrees. The belt of low pressure is expected to move away in the early morning. The whole day tomorrow it will be bright and warm in most areas, with temperatures 11 to 14 degrees, slightly above normal for this time of the year. Coastal areas will be warmer, and you can expect a fair amount of sunshine. This will be better weather news for holidaymakers. And that's all from me. Now back to Francis with more news. You are going to listen to the second part of section one. Betty wants to drive to see her friend. Now she is listening to the radio, traffic information. As you listen, look at the notes and tick if the information is correct, or write in the necessary changes. Now look at questions five to seven. Now listen carefully and answer questions five to seven. This is KSU Radio. It's Friday, May the fourth, seven thirty in the morning. This is traffic information. Here is a message for all motorists. Most major roads leading in and out of London are congested. Motorists should use alternative routes wherever possible. Here is the local traffic news. Heavy rain during the night has flooded parts of the South Circular Road. An articulated lorry has broken down on the M2. The traffic is now only two lanes and moving very slowly. Strong winds during the night have blown down a number of trees on the M5, and many sections are not in use. That is the end of local traffic news. For more news, listen again at eight o'clock. That is the end of section one. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. In this section, first you are going to hear a dialogue in which a Camford student answers the questions of a young girl who is thinking of applying to go there. As you listen to the dialogue, circle the correct answer and fill in the table. Now you will have some time to look at questions eight to sixteen. Now listen to the dialogue and answer questions eight to sixteen. You're a student of the University of Camford, aren't you? Yes, I am. 
I'd like to apply to go to this university. Could you tell me something about it? Certainly. What would you like to know? Well, um, for a start, what's the campus like? It's large. It's spread out, and it mainly consists of medieval colleges. But it's in the middle of a large manufacturing town, so there's a lot of traffic. And what about the student accommodation? It's mainly in colleges on the campus. Is it? And how do you find the rooms? They're old and quite charming, but they're expensive and badly heated. How about the study facilities? Very good. In the main building, there are 30 study rooms accommodating 20 students in each, and four large lecture rooms, all are air-conditioned. Each lecture room is equipped with film and slide projectors and screen, a closed-circuit TV and tape recorder wired to central speakers, and an overhead projector. Each study room is too equipped with a closed-circuit TV and overhead projector. And the computer centre, what's it like? Oh, it's well equipped. There are 60 computers in the centre. They are all available for student use. The computers are in constant demand, so you need to book in advance. You can reserve a computer for three hours at a time. If you need to print anything, you may use one of the six laser printers. There's always someone in the centre for advice, or in case something goes wrong. Hmm. And how about the laboratories? They are large. They're quite modern, and they're well equipped. I see. And the libraries? Can you tell me what the libraries are like? Well, they're generally well stocked, and there's a lot of historical manuscripts, science, social sciences, and arts books. But the sitting accommodation is limited. How about the health centre? It's not very big, but well staffed. There are medical and dental units. You can always have immediate attention. And the cultural facilities? There is a small university theatre and two art galleries. Thank you so much for the information. Now listen to the second part of this section. The young girl, Debbie Milan, applied to go to the University of Camford. She has been accepted by the university. You will hear the conversation between the chairman of the International Society and the newly arrived student. As you listen to the conversation, fill in the gaps numbered 17 to 20. Now you will have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 17 to 20. Hello there. What are you studying? Computing science. Oh yes. And how long is the course for? One year. It's a postgraduate diploma. What would you like to do at the end of it? Have you made your mind up? Yes. I'd like to be a teacher in a university in my country. Would you? That sounds interesting. Tell me, though. Why have you chosen this university? It's got a good reputation in the field of computing science. Where do you come from? Sri Lanka. Oh, that's a country I've always wanted to go to. You are Miss Malau, aren't you? I've got your name on my list here. Yes, Debbie Malau. Would you like to give the students a talk about your country? Yes, I'd like to very much. Debbie Malau. Is presenting her paper about her country, Sri Lanka, at the seminar. As you listen to the presentation, complete the notes. Now you will have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully. And answer questions 21 to 27. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about my country, Sri Lanka. It is an island with an area of 25,332 square miles, and a population of 12,510,000 people. It is just smaller in area than Scotland. The island of Sri Lanka lies off the southeast coast of India. And is separated from the mainland by the Polk Strait. People who live there sometimes call it by an old name, which means Golden Island. Sri Lanka is considered to be one of the most beautiful countries in the world. What is the climate like there? It is totally different from the climate in Britain. 
Britain has a temperature climate. As Sri Lanka lies not very far north of the equator, the climate of the island is tropical. It is hot all the year round. Heavy rains fall during the monsoon season, making the climate hot and humid. Consequently, vegetation grows dense and thick. And the jungle is so impenetrable in parts of the island that it is difficult to proceed without cutting a path with a machete, a large, heavy knife with a broad blade. Although the main centres of population are in the flat, fertile coastal regions, many people live in the mountainous country inland. This area contains mountain peaks such as Adams Peak and Mount Pedro. They are twice as high as any mountains in Britain. But in spite of the mountains and rough terrain, the communications are good, and it is easy to travel around the island by road and rail. There are four airports; the main one being in Bandaranaik, situated 34 kilometers (21 miles) north of Colombo, the capital of Sri Lanka. Okay, I'll leave some time to you to ask me questions. Are there any questions? What about the natural resources that you have in Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka is rich in natural resources. The main natural resources are rubber, tea, and coconuts, and they are on the island's most important exports. Rubber is produced in the tropical forests, and tea is harvested on the slopes of the inland hills. Coconuts grow in abundance. The sea is rich with fish, which the people catch in small boats with large three-cornered sails. What sort of food is grown in your country? In Sri Lanka, rice is grown for local consumption. We eat rice because the main diet is rice and fish. But we also have potatoes, vegetables, and almost all the items you have here. What about the animals? Do you have any special animals in Sri Lanka? Yes. Deep in the forest, there are many wild animals such as elephants, leopards, crocodiles, monkeys, snakes, and a strange animal called a giant monitor. A kind of lizard over two meters, six feet long, which has strong claws and can climb trees. There are also many rare birds, which are hardly seen anywhere else on Earth. Well, if you are interested in Sri Lanka and still have questions, you may ask me at any time after the seminar presentation. Thank you. That is the end of section two. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. In this section, you will hear a conversation between Pat and Martin. They are students of a university and haven't seen each other for some time. They have met in the cafeteria at lunchtime. As you listen to their conversation, answer questions twenty-eight to thirty-four. Now you will have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty-four. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty-four. Hi there, Pat. How are you? I'm fine, thanks, Martin. I haven't seen you for a long time. What have you been up to? Oh, studying. It seems that university life is much more time-consuming than I originally thought. I even don't have time to read newspapers. Really? You're so busy. You know, I read an article in yesterday's newspaper. It's very interesting. What's it about? It's about post office cats. They're mouse hunters. That really sounds interesting. Could you tell me something about the story now? Yes, certainly. The post office has actually employed cats since 1868. That means that they have been on the official payroll of, of the post office for more than a hundred years. 
the loyal public servants appear on the official payroll as rodent operative, but we would more easily recognise them under the title post office cat. They are not employed to sort or deliver mail, of course, but to protect the mail and keep the rodent population under control. What do you mean? They're mouse hunters. They make sure your morning post arrives nibble free. You know, they work unsocial hours while we sleep. They hardly ever get a Christmas bonus in their pay packets and can't bargain for better conditions. The average rate of pay is no more than a few pounds a month, just enough to pay for their food. But they are allowed to eat all the mice they can catch. How come the post office had the idea to employ cats? Usually, the public had to queue inside post offices for their mail. The whole idea of the post office employing cats to control the rodent population goes back to the days prior to 1867, as a part of the jubilee celebrations of Queen Victoria. It was decided that there would be a house-to-house delivery of letters by postmen. As a result, there was a huge accumulation of letters and parcels at post offices. Vast numbers of rats and mice began to hide amongst the mail and nibbled at letters and parcels. Yes, I see. They caused great damage to the mail. That's right. So, in 1868, the post office authorities decided to employ cats to keep the rodent population under control. Most of the cats they employed were females. Why was that? Because it was thought that females were better and more persistent hunters than the males. If the number of mice in a post office did not decline greatly after six months, then these cats were to be dismissed from their place of work. London post offices were the first to try out the experiment. Within a few months, the rodent population had shrunk dramatically. Other post offices all over the country were soon using cats in the war against rats and mice. Within ten years, the pay of the cats was improved from one and a half old pence a day to a six or nine pence a day. Now the average rate of pay is about a few pounds a month. So some of the hard-working cats have become quite famous. Have you heard of the cat named Lucky? No. Tell me the story about her, please. Okay, Lucky became the most distinguished of all the cats. In 1980, she foiled an attempted robbery in a Worcestershire post office, and she did so all on her own. How did she do it? As the two burglars made their way in through the window, Lucky flew at them. She sank her claws into the back of one of the men and into the neck of the other. Oh, I see. This was a surprise attack. Yeah, this surprise attack was too much for the men, and they fled empty-handed. For this heroic behaviour, Lucky was awarded the first ever post office DFC certificate, that is the Distinguished Feline Conduct Certificate. Another excellent mouse was Jerry of Earl's Court Post Office in London. He served the building for 16 years and was on duty for 24 hours every day. He drove all the mice away from the premises. How about today? Does the post office still employ cats as mouse hunters? Well, there are fewer cats employed by the post office than at any time in the past. Their profession is yet another example of a profession laid low by the advances of new technology. With the faster movement of the mail and more hygienic surroundings, post office cats are not always needed to keep down the rodent population. But many post offices still employ them, and they become great friends with the postmen, who often feed them. When one cat suffered an accident at work, it was taken promptly to the vet in a nearby city to receive the best attention, and the post office willingly footed the bill. According to the post office, there is no plan for their services to be discontinued in the foreseeable future. This is a really fascinating story. Thank you very much. That is the end of section three. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. In section four, you will hear a lecture about Esperanto. As you listen to the lecture, answer questions thirty-five to forty-two. 
Now you will have some time to look at questions 35 to 42. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 35 to 42. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our lecture. It's a good pleasure for me to welcome Professor Nesbitt of the University of Edinburgh. He is going to give us a lecture about a world language. Professor Nesbitt, please. Today I'm going to talk about languages, or more especially about a world language. What would the world be like if everyone spoke the same language? Would we understand each other better and be more sympathetic to each other's causes? I'm not talking about everyone sharing the same first language, but sharing the same second language. And I'm not talking about English, but Esperanto. That's spelled E-S-P-E-R-A-N-T-O. This is an artificial language. What are the facts about Esperanto? Well, it was invented in 1887 by Dr. Ludwig Zasarus Zamelhof, a Polish philologist. The vocabulary comes mainly from Western European languages, and the grammar is similar to Slavic languages. It sounds like Italian. Esperanto means hopeful, and it was Zamelhof's hope that a common language would promote a friendship and an understanding amongst all people of the world. His inspiration is summed up by the Esperanto term interno indio, which means central idea, and it is an idea of human peace and justice. I think Esperanto will become the world language in the future. Esperanto is taught in many schools in Yugoslavia and Hungary. China is very interested. About 400,000 people have learnt Esperanto in China, it is spoken all over the world by approximately 10 million people and there are many who would like Esperanto to be the official second language of the world. It has such internal logic that it could become the international computer language. From the learner's point of view, it has the advantage that there are no exceptions to rules. The advantages of the world being able to talk freely to each other about business, politics, culture sport, hobbies, well, are obvious. The costs of translation at any international conference are staggering. About 55% of the EEC's budget in Strasbourg is taken up by translation costs. The main advantage, as I see, is that Esperanto is a neutral language. It doesn't have the national, political and cultural bias that all others, of course, have. If everybody has to learn a second language, then everybody is equal. Well, I'll stop here for questions. Excuse me, I'd like to ask a question. Why should people have to learn another language? Why not English as the world language? I mean, there are already so many people who speak English throughout the world. I think English is one of those languages which for many seems easy at the beginning but then the bridge between basic knowledge and mastery takes a long time to cross, and many people give up. Why should people have to learn English? For many, it's a waste of time of spelling, of the large number of exceptions to any rule. It is very idiomatic, and the prepositions are terrible. On the contrary, Esperanto is a very easy language to learn. The tense system has none of the complications of English, and the grammar is based on just 16 rules which have no exceptions. There are five vowel sounds in Esperanto, but 20 vowel sounds in English. The most remarkable thing is that after a very short time, the learners find that they can express quite sophisticated ideas, the same sort of things that they would want to say in their own language. Professor Nesbitt, thank you very much. That is the end of section four. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers.